good afternoon or good morning to wherever you may be Zooming in from. I'm Rachel Messerich, Programs Manager, Legacy and Editorial for the American Craft Council and the coordinator behind the American Craft Forum series. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this American Craft Forum's program in association with our quarterly magazine, American Craft. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and representing the offices of the American Craft Council in Minneapolis, which are both located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. This place carries a complicated and layered history. In the thousands of years the Dakota and Ojibwe people have been in relationship and kinship with the land here, and in the several hundred years since European settlers colonized the land that the state of Minnesota now occupies, the United States land seizure was a project of destruction that denied the Dakota and Ojibwe free and unhindered access to land that fundamentally shapes their identity and lives. We pay tribute to the Dakota and Ojibwe and invite you to consider the land on which you live and the confluence of legacies that bring you to stand where you are, particularly through critical reflection and conversation with your own community. Fostering conversation and community are at the heart of ACC's mission, and American Craft serves as one of the most vital contributions and service to this mission, and hopefully to the field of craft and American culture. ACC's 80 plus year old publication contributes to the craft conversation by shining a light on the diversity, resilience, beauty, and impact of American Craft and its makers. In 2023, we have looked at craft through the lens of four themes, inhabit, vessel, wild, and now collect. The editorial team is just wrapping up the winter issue, Light, which will be hitting mailboxes in mid-November and will send us into 2024. Plans are well underway for the spring 2024 issue on Ritual. We encourage pitches and submissions from our community and have more information on the rest of the 2024 themes on our website. Please check under Writer's Guidelines and Submissions for more information. Before I dive into the program and my introduction, I also just wanted to thank the ACC staff, particularly our executive director, Andrea Specht, our uber talented editorial team, our amazing marketing team, and our director of finance and administration, Tracy Lamperty, who is taking the behind the scenes tech helm for today's program. The American Craft Council is a national nonprofit member-based organization. As such, I would also like to give a big shout out to our donors and members who make programs like this possible, and a very special thank you to the Minnesota State Arts Board and Wingate Charitable Foundation for their generous support. An additional thank you to Louis Eng, a, an LA sound engineer, supporting this program with VJ and Eric on the other end of the Zoom line. A few technical and logistical reminders, please make sure that your camera is off and your audio is muted for the program and conversation. We encourage you to participate in the talk via the chat feature and drop any comments or questions there. Closed captioning is available during this program. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a closed caption symbol. Clicking that button will turn this feature on and off. This program will also be recorded and available for future viewing. In the fall issue, we explored the theme collect a word that not only speaks to the objects we surround ourselves with, but also to the state of mind that we need to be in to do our best work and to keep seeking inspiration. What started as an idea for a story about a renowned musician who collects various versions of the instrument he plays became a powerful story about how craft lives and breathes through different hands and spaces and how it can connect and create a relationship between two people. Because at its heart, craft is not a static endeavor. For luthier Eric Benning of Benning Violins, craft lives through multiple generations of a family business that makes world-renowned stringed instruments for those just learning and those gracing some of the world's greatest stages. When Benning completes a violin, he doesn't just hang it on the wall. It's not merely decorative. He places that violin in the hands of someone like virtuoso violinist Vijay Gupta who then uses it to direct his own creative force, his gift, his craft. This object that appears static and still complete continues its journey through Gupta's playing. To help guide us and our speakers through this conversation on the symbiotic relationship between maker and player, I'd like to introduce our incredible moderator, American Crafts Senior Editor, Jennifer Vogel, who will in turn provide brief introductions for our speakers. Jen, I invite you to turn on your camera now. 
Jennifer Vogel is the senior editor of American Craft. She has worked as a reporter, writer, and editor for many publications and outlets, including Minnesota Public Radio, City Pages, and Mother Jones. Jennifer, who holds a degree in journalism from the University of Minnesota, published a memoir, Flim Flam Man, that won the Minnesota Book Award. She is an avid reader, a decent cook, an enthusiastic boat passenger, and an appreciator of things that are beautiful and also useful. Thank you so much, Jen, and thanks again to you all. I leave it to you. Thank you, Rachel. What a privilege it is to be here today. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we are fortunate to have in our midst two amazing people who are each at the top of their fields and who work together to make gorgeous music enjoyed by fans from all walks of life. Eric Benning is a third generation luthier or violin maker based in Studio City, a neighborhood of Los Angeles. With his parents as mentors, he began making his first violin at age nine and completed it when he was 11. So far, he's crafted more than 120 violins, violas, and cellos, and now he's passing along his considerable skills to his children. Vijay Gupta, a virtuoso violinist who grew up in the Hudson Valley, New York, was enrolled at Juilliard at age seven and first performed solo at age 11. Five years ago, Gupta left the Los Angeles Philharmonic to focus on using music to help people, including through his organization, Street Symphony, which provides musical experiences to the homeless and incarcerated. Gupta has played many instruments during his career, but he discovered and fell in love with Eric Benning's violins. You'll hear him play one today in a minute. These two have formed an interesting partnership, and I'd even say friendship. It's a fascinating alliance that exists between the person who creates an instrument and the person who plays it. They need each other in complex ways, and they bring out the best in each other's work. I invite Vijay and Eric to turn on their cameras, though it looks like the uh, Vijay's is already on. He's offered to play something for us on his 2010 Benning Stradivarius model violin, and we lucky viewers get to sit back and
<laughs> well, that was lovely. You couldn't hear me, but I was, <laughs> I was applauding. <laughs> um, so, so that, that you're thinking of that as your introduction, uh, basically, VJ, VJ, right? Eric, do you want to say anything by way of introduction? Um, tell us where we are, where you're coming from, and and uh, the family shop. How long have you had it? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm still blown away. That, that sounded great. <laughs> yeah, you, it was fantastic. I was in the room, so it was <laughs> it was really nice. Um, yeah, I'm a third generation, as you introduced me before, but uh, we've been in this location since 1953, and my family's been in this business. Uh, since the very early 1900s. Um, so my grandfather came out here from Chicago and started this business, um, like I said, in 1953. But um, it's been a real honor and privilege to grow up in this community as well, you know, in terms of a, a musical community. Um, so there's a certain aspect of obligation uh, not just to the family name, but to the community as a whole. Um, but I feel that sort of that responsibility, especially because I'm the one that's the next in line, and I have sons who are working with me. And um, but yeah, I don't know. I could wax eloquent, but mm -hmm. I'll leave that for VJ. <laughs> you know, it really is an incredible honor to step into the shop knowing the artists, um, you know, living and gone, who have been in this room. Um, you know, I, I just walked past Eric's father, Hans Benning, and remember in 2007 when I joined the LA Philharmonic, my first rehearsals were just down the street, mm -hmm. uh, right down Coenga at the Hollywood Bowl. And musicians who were my new colleagues, my new family members in the LA Phil saying, well, you know, Hans Benning, used to work on the violins of people like Heifetz, you know, people like that used to come through shops like this. Of course, you know, there were incredible artists here in Los Angeles in the 50s who intersected with the Benning family. I just mentioned Heifetz, but, you know, Piatigorsky was here. A number of remarkable musicians uh, were here. And, you know, to walk through this shop and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, know that Hilary Hahn has been in this room, that Eric has worked with her when an artist is traveling through L.A. Um, and they have a concert at Disney Hall or the Hollywood Bowl that night, they might stop, they might stop by this shop mm -hmm. and have things worked on. So, um, you know, I feel like I'm also stepping into that tradition as an artist as well. And um, there's a lot more to say there, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pause for, for a moment and allow a question and conversation to unfold. Well, um, I, I guess we could start with um, how you two met. And um, I know a little bit about that from Vijay's point of view, from the story that we ran. Um, and I don't know who wants to start out talking about that. Should I say, Eric, um, <laughs> tell me about the sure. first time that Vijay walked into your shop and what, what he was looking for and how was that for you? Well, I may not have recalled the exact first time, but I just remember at some point you bringing in uh, the Montagnana violin that belonged to the LA Philharmonic. And you were struggling with certain aspects of the sound. Um, it was a little bit of a temperamental instrument. And I think the first things I was relaying to you was, well, now that you've been given this Montagnana to play, you need to make it yours. Um, it had been set up for somebody else. And now we need to take that body and set it up for you and what your voice is, what your expectation. And also with older instruments, there has to be a, you know, as a luthier, I can set it up as best as I can for the player. But the player also has to learn how this old instrument wants to be played. It's sort of like, you know, an, an old dog. You, you have to start to figure out its tricks. You know, it, it, you can't maybe teach an old dog. We can get to, <laughs> to new dogs and how easy they are to train, per se. But I just remember thinking, you know, okay, we've got to work with this instrument together till we find your voice within it. Mm. Um, and there's certain instruments, especially when you're loaned an instrument. We see this all the time where people are loaned great named instruments 
but they they don't feel a connection with that instrument. It's like, oh, here, here's a Strad. Why don't you play on this? And they play it, and they're like, it's it's not what they expected to come out of their hands. Mm -hmm. They they don't feel a relationship to the output. And um, I mean, just as an aside, I'm working with with um, Bob Demain right now with the Strad cello, mm -hmm. and he's struggled with that Strad cello for so long, and finally he left it. I was able to do a whole new setup on it, and I, he just texted me the other night. He's like, this is the first time I actually feel like I connect to this instrument. <laughs> wow. And there's more to go, but instead of that instrument just sitting in a locker, it's going to be played again. And that's sort of the joy for me, um, to see whatever happens, whether it's one of my instruments or you know the 1684 Strad being used uh, to try and, as best as I can, um, create the vehicle so that you can do what you do, mm -hmm. you know, and I have to look at who the player is and go, okay, what is, what is he or she capable of? Uh, what are they capable of? And how, how can the instrument help them get to that, that end product? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the way that I, I think about <clears throat> all music making is that this is the sound of a relationship. You know, whether I'm playing the music off a composer like, you know, a giant like Bach or a living giant, say the music of, you know, Esa Pekka Salonen or Rina Esmail. Part of my job is to inhabit the expression of a piece of music. And I, as a player, kind of want to make my craft, the technique of my work, transparent or maybe translucent to the expression of the composer. Um, and that is to inhabit this piece and say, well, what is it the composer was trying to say and what is it that I'm trying to say? And there's another entry point here of the instrument itself, you know, which also needs to become its own kind of membrane where the instrument can't be getting in the way of that expression. So as an artist, I'm always in service to something bigger than myself. I, I, I keep thinking like practicing feels like praying, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it feels like praying because I know I'm never going to be as good as Bach was. I'm never going to get quite there. And, you know, whether I'm playing on Eric's gorgeous instrument or playing on at that time at 1731 priceless Montagnana violin, I'm always trying to find the way to make my technique suit the musical intention that I'm trying to pursue. And one of the, the quotes uh, I remember a teacher telling me very early on is that the violin never belongs to the player. <laughs> you know, just like we are guests here on earth and we've got to leave this world better than we found it. I feel that's my responsibility towards the instrument. Like she's going to have a much longer life than I, than I will. <laughs> and my job is to inhabit my time with this instrument and uh, find a relationship with that. And I think one of the things that we forget about when we talk about great composers or great artists or great violins is that it always emerged from a relationship, you know, and, and I remember learning from you so much, Eric, of like, yeah, strads were not great just because they were great instruments made one time and then Strad said, well, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I've now made this instrument. Right. They were great because they were set up and they were molded in the first several years or decades of their existence by Stradivarius and the people who then occupied his bench after him and the artists playing those violins. Yeah. It was a reciprocal relationship that then crafted that instrument and made it something that still is living and breathing and changing yeah. today. It's yeah. alive. It's still alive. Yeah, it still it still changes. It's amazing how much how much adaptation has happened. It looks the same. Like this this is the Baroque style. So this is what a Strad would have looked like with that short fingerboard and and uh, some short neck, but. We have longer fingerboard, longer necks, different bass bars, different posts. So while it looks similar on the outside, a lot of innovation has occurred. And a lot of innovation with string technology, um, just all sorts of, of exciting things for us. While it doesn't visually look like things have changed, it, it really has. Mm -hmm. I mean, mainly because like spaces have changed too. So Yeah. Pardon me. Um, so... So let's let's make this concrete for people. Um, so the, the violin you just played, uh, BJ, 
Can you tell us about, you, you know, Eric talked about how part of the relationship between maker and musician is helping musician find their voice or hopefully you you know there's like a, a a kismet there and so so tell me what it what it's like for you to play that particular instrument and how it feels to have found your voice if that's how you feel and Eric then I'm going to ask you to maybe talk about how you made that violin and mm -hmm. then we can talk about how you adjusted it to make it just right um or VJ. So maybe we can start with you, VJ. Well, it's a bit of a funny story here that um, I promise feeds into this, but I was playing on the Montagnana violin from the LA Phil, and I was invited to give a talk in St. Albert, Alberta in February, and it was going to be like negative 35, um, which uh, although I grew up in New York, uh, having moved to LA, I was not looking forward to that. But I was also concerned about the orchestra's Montagnana, and I didn't want to be in a hostile climate. So I said, hey, Eric, <laughs> is there something that you're making? Um, and it wasn't this violin at the time. Eric had just completed a Bergonzi mm -hmm. model um, violin, and I took it to Canada with me, and I didn't want to stop playing it. There was something about that instrument. There was something about the sound and the contact I had with that violin that just blew me away. And that was actually the first instrument of Eric's that I ended up purchasing. And then a couple of years later, um, Eric had very generously said, you know, if there's ever an instrument that I make that you like better, I'll exchange it at, at, at cost, essentially. And I came across this Strad model violin. And this violin entered my life at a very interesting time because it's when I left the LA Philharmonic. And I personally, as an artist, was asking, well, who am I? Who am I? And the way an, a musician asks, who are you, is they're asking, what's your sound? What's my sound? And my favorite violinist growing up was the violinist Nathan Milstein. Um, he played on an amazing Stradivarius violin, which actually lives here in Los Angeles. And I was lucky enough to record an album on that violin. And every day I got to practice on that instrument, I would just stare at it. And I would feel like I was holding a part of Milstein's soul and when Nathan Milstein had that violin, he named it the Marie Therese because his wife was Marie and his daughter was Therese and that was the other sacred woman in his life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was looking for my Marie Therese. I was looking for that relationship. And there's these stories of Milstein that he didn't put the violin away in a case. He had it out all day long. He didn't practice, he was playing all day long. He just played all day long. And that's the relationship I wanted with my violin. And so, you know, I left the LA Phil, I met this instrument, and then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And that was a time when I wasn't playing on concert hall stages. Um, I started recording myself at home a lot more. I started working with an incredible recording engineer to create albums and, you know, documents of music, and I was looking for my sound. And it was in this violin that I started to find that silvery, shimmering, bright, tensile, liquid, quicksilver sound. Um, and, and I feel like now I know what my sound is. I'm looking for that sound. I'm looking for that response in the violin. And I guess this then feeds into Eric, um, how you kind of helped us create that sound. Yeah, well. So, so first, Eric, will you yeah. tell us what, what went into making this violin? The, well, you, we're a craft council, so like, yeah. what sort of wood? Like, you know, we want to know all sure. the little nitty gritty. Sure. <laughs> well, I I have the I have the good fortune to have very old wood. So this is wood that my grandfather got probably in the nineteen. He probably got it in the twenties or thirties, but it was probably exported in the forties. So this is probably old Bosnian maple. Uh, the tops easily from either the 1920s or 30s as well. My grandfather wasn't great at marking things, but that's when he bought most of these things. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have great materials. And then I have a, a, a great uncle, Carl Becker, who really was my mentor and my teacher. And, you know, basically having a family, you get a family recipe. So this is our family recipe that's been handed down and i can look at notes from my grandfather from my grandfather i can look at my great uncle's notes and i can i can see oh how much did that back weigh oh that that back weighed you know 75 grams oh you know i have a very similar tap tone and i have a similar weight um 
And then if I see who the owner is, then I go, oh, I know that violin. I know how it sounds. And, oh, that's kind of, you know, so when I'm making an instrument, usually the first thing, unless I'm being commissioned an instrument, if I'm just making one for me, you know, to sell, obviously, but if I'm just making it, I, I just am inspired by the wood itself. I'm just, I will pick out a back first and I'll just look at the back and I'll be like, yeah, I want to make that. I, I just, you know, I'm going to make four or five instruments a year and that's, that's the piece. Sometimes you, you just, uh, I just finished four violas all with the exact same tree. And it was just so much, so much fun to make them because the first one is like okay get used to it the second one you felt a little bit more intuitive and then third one and then the fourth one i'm like hey i, I got this piece of wood down i, I understand what it's going to do for me um and now i'm done with the wood but <laughs> you know but that's it it's not it's not like i set out like when i made this violin i didn't set out you know oh i'm you know vj's my 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 goal it was to make something beautiful that has a fantastic sound and then when somebody plays it, it, it usually has to be within 90 to 95% of the way towards inspiration for them. Mm. And then with my help, hopefully, I can get them the rest of the way there. But, but if VJ had picked this up and said, oh, you know, it's, it's bright, it's, it's great, but it didn't, if it, it didn't already register with him, then working with him on a platform that wasn't already 90% of the way there would, would have been futile. We've been wasting our time. Oh, let me change strings. Let me change the sound post. If it's not close, it's not worth investing that type of time. And then with new instruments too, because they've never, they've never vibrated whatsoever, there's a learning process where the wood learns to vibrate and it's, it's his input into it develops even just small micro fissures in the varnish. Um, it, it learns flexibilities and, and ease the more he plays on it. So that's sort of the interesting thing about old instruments when I said they, you almost have to, to channel the old player to get it to sound the way you pictured them playing it because they had the touch they had a they had a sense of oh you know it, it becomes intuitive so they're not thinking about it but their brain's already been attuned to it so when you pick up an old instrument you have to go you know oh you know how did you know how did Judith Shapiro play on this you know oh that's right she was very you know she was a very horizontal player well I'm a very you know vertical you know and that's what was so much fun is saying oh this is my voice okay well what can i do to sort of tweak the edges so it becomes even more you and then it's a relationship where he's playing it he's developing it and i'm just sort of like the the pit crew or the maintenance crew that keeps things always on the top of their game because you know it's artwork it is artwork but it's artwork that has to perform so that's why you know stradivarius and Guineries, these other instruments, sometimes people invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into the restoration because it has to perform. It's not going to sit on a wall. It has to do something. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the joy of it and mm -hmm. the fun of it. VJ, um, how, so how, I have to ask when I, when I listen to this process, it's fascinating. From your end, how do you know when you've reached the point where it's, you know, fully representing what it is that you want to express. Like, how do you even know what you're aiming for? I'll let you know when I get there. Never. <laughs> Never. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the joy and challenge of the process of being an artist. Um, you know, I, I'm incredibly, I mentioned my recording engineer, who's actually on the other side of this, this camera right now, uh, who I'm very lucky to work with. And I feel like, you know, Lewis, who's based here in Los Angeles and recorded so many incredible artists, he's kind of um, my mirror, you know, the, the other end of this terminus, you know, one side is Eric and one side is Lewis, because I want to hear, you know, I, I kind of live by this aphorism, like, I know who I am when I see what I do, or I know who I am when I hear what I do. And 
there's so much of this, ob, you know, obje- what's objective and what's subjective, and it's changing all the time. I'm very lucky to be the artist in residence with an organization called Music Worcester. And I got to play in this amazing, one of the most incredible acoustics in America called Mechanics Hall. And for anyone who's interested in recording engineering, there's actually a patch on recording software that replicates the acoustics of Mechanics Hall. And Lewis and I got to go and record Eric's violin on stage at Mechanics Hall. And it was, again, another relationship being met by another partner because playing in Mechanics Hall, I felt like I could do no wrong. And it was it was almost a spiritual experience. And I have to find ways to articulate what felt right about that, what felt right about those seemingly mystical conditions. The audience was right. My preparation was right. The instrument was right. The hall was right. The mics were right. It was all of that stuff. Um, so there is a, a bit of mystery that goes into it. And I would say if I were to start to articulate that, there's a bit of the internal process and the external process, right? The external process being how is this registering with the audience, right? So I'll always have people out in the hall who I trust, whose ears I trust, i.e. Lewis, to say, this is what's coming across. This is how I'm hearing this. Um, And then there's the internal process, which is how I feel, how I've practiced, um, how I need the instrument to respond in real time. Because when I'm in the heat of a performance and I don't trust a space or I don't know the space well, I have to revert to kind of the faith I've built through my practice in the instrument. Can't, will the instrument respond the way that I need it to? And that's not just about the violin. That's also about the bow. And I have, you know, two bows here, which we, we can talk about. This is a replica of uh, what's called a Baroque bow, the kind of bow that Bach would have been using. And then this is a bit more of a modern bow. This is what I'll play modern repertoire on or play with my piano trio on. So it's this give and take of this process all the time. But ultimately, I have to remember I'm in service to an audience. I've got to convey, you know, what the expression is. That's my goal. Well, so when you were, um, so the two of you get together, maybe you can sort of tell me how the process goes. Like, are, what are you adjusting? And then do you play it for a bit and go, oh, well, that's not quite right. Um, you know, maybe we can start with you, Eric. Um, yeah. Are you, you listen to what he's saying or are you listening to the playing and going, mm, that could be, a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and then maybe you can show us what you actually would do to adjust it. Yeah, I usually, uh, we have space in the front for adjustment. So when a customer or somebody who's trying an instrument comes in, I usually just ask them like a doctor would like, so what brings you in today? Um, because it's, I, I don't want to put my expectations or my stamp on a sound that would be contrary to the musician. So if the musician comes in and says, oh, my instrument, you know, sounds way too bright and I think it sounds too dark, I wouldn't want to steer them my direction. They're the ones making the music. So I usually say, oh, what brings you in today? And, you know, oh, it feels like it's, it, you know, maybe it sounds a little covered sounding or it's a little, it's not as quickly as, as responding as, as, you know, we have a vernacular that we speak. We have a language that we speak when it comes to adjustment where they describe what they're lacking in the instrument. It'd be like me with a dull knife, like, you know, what what brings you in today? Well, my knife is dull, you know. Oh, is it dull the whole way? You know, whatever it is. But there's a sound post inside the instrument just underneath this bridge foot. And that post is not glued in, it's just held in with tension. And that sound post, the French call it the sole of the instrument, Um, it's what allows luthiers an ability to change the dynamics of how this machine vibrates so just as like you'll notice like vj will when he plays he will vary his bow position on the strings so he when he brings the bow closer to the bridge it focuses up the sound. There's more intensity. There's more, you know, gravity to the to the sound. As he gets a little bit over the fingerboard, it it opens up the sound a little bit more freedom, but a little less concentration. Well, we have that same ability with the sound post on the other side. 
So if, I, if he gave me a comment like, oh, you know, I want more intensity, I want more, you know, when I want to, you know, I've got a big concert I'm playing, I want as much intensity as possible. Well, then I will set that sound post up to give the most reaction of the violin. So um, I don't know if there's any great space to do this, but uh, uh, Rene Morel, who is a great adjusting expert in New York, used to say, all you have to do is think about a diving board, you know, like, you know, if you think about, this isn't a great service, probably won't come through, but I don't know, can you guys see that? Okay, so if I want more intensity, I would stiffen that up. And you can see what happens, it, things become stiffer. And, you know, I, I like to think of it a little bit like a trampoline. Um, if you want to jump high, you have to have tight springs. Now that assumes that the person jumping is heavy enough and can put enough energy into those springs to make you jump high. If you're a very light, gentle player, then you actually need looser springs so that you take advantage of this trampoline effect, because this is what's happening with the violin plates. They're going up and down. And for somebody like Vijay, I already know, like on this instrument, he needs he needs to jump. He's a jumper. You know, he's going to, he's going to ask as much out of this as possible. Now, on his Baroque instrument, which has gut strings, which is played very differently, which is played a lot more with this very horizontal type bow, where, where everything's softer. Well, you have to set that up differently. You have to set it up so that the body is is looser and it's 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 ready to accept a bow that's not quite as heavy and not being played, driven quite as hard. So um, that's our main tool of adjusting is sound posts. But these things never are static. There, there's forces of nature that are playing on them. Um, over, over decades, things settle in. So it's a nonstop, you know, it's a nonstop <laughs> process of always trying to maintain these instruments. You know, wood is oxidizing, uh, varnishes are in the process of both being deteriorated in some spots, as you could see here, and in other spots where it's thick, it's getting harder. The oils are actually getting harder. So what the varnish is doing, how it's building up, you know, some areas will have to be built up over the years where we'll restore varnish. Um, they're never they're never stagnant, so they're always changing and evolving, and uh, that's what's exciting about it. You know, string technology, like he could take this exact same violin, and we could put a, a set of these Baroque strings, and you wouldn't recognize the violin. You wouldn't recognize the sound of it. And if I left the sound post and the tailpiece all the way they were, he would hate the way it plays, I guarantee you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, for me, I, I, I think of myself almost more like a pit crew, like I said. I, I have to get this guy to, to run the Indy 500, and what is it going to take to, to do that? Right. You know, it, it's physics. So, you know, what he does, I think, is to me, is magic or alchemy. <laughs> you know, but what I do is physics. Like, I, I look at this and I just go, okay, well, physically what is happening and how can I get that response and things? Making music, I... That's that's magic. <laughs> well, and then I'll, I'll sort of just I'll briefly weigh in just to say, you know, it's also, um, you know, it's physics and it's patience because I am very impatient. I want I want the response immediately if I if I get frustrated very quickly, if a thing is not going because and maybe it's just my temperament, but it's also that there's so much to do and so much to learn and so much where we just need to be able to execute immediately what's going on and respond very quickly to the conditions in the room and the conditions musically. So if I see, you know, triple pianissimo sul tasto right after a triple fortissimo, you know, I have to be able to know exactly what to do physically in my instrument and in my body um, in the instrument of my body to make the instrument actually convey that. And that what's interesting for, especially for a traveling musician, is they've studied and they say that an instrument can pick up 3% of its weight in water in humid environments. So if you picture, you know, something like this picking up 3% more weight 
in a humid environment, well, that's energy that he needs to now expend. He needs to expend that much more energy. So the wood is heavier, it's now denser, and it doesn't vibrate as much. But he's got to somehow figure out how to make it work. And then when it's very dry and the wood is lighter, it's more highly reactive, but it also gets sandy sounding. It gets uh, brittle. It can get shrill on the E string. So, you know, we try and keep these things as, you know, humidified as consistently as possible. But, you know, he's a working musician. He's out there on the racetrack. You know, he's, he's, it's not always perfect conditions. You know, sometimes he's going to the snowy conditions and sometimes it's, you know, the middle of a desert search scenario. Who knows? But, so, so VJ, to... oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. So VJ, I just wanted to ask, so how did you, like you've played a lot of violins in your life, obviously. Um, how did you know, or what's different about Eric's violins or what do Eric's violins allow you to do that you weren't able to do maybe with other violins or mm. what did it bring to your performances? Well, I mean, one sort of non-artistic, non-metaphysical thing that is really worth saying is that I can afford this instrument. Mm. Um, and that's a that's a big deal. Not a small matter, yeah. It's a really big deal. Um, one of my favorite violinists is an artist named Christian Tetzlaff, who plays on an instrument made by a remarkable German violin maker named Greiner. And Tetzlaff was very frank about it. He said, well, I'd rather buy, be able to buy a beautiful home and send my kids to school and have an instrument that I know will not be owned by a bank um, that'll be taken away from me. And there's a number of examples where artists have, as you we were talking about, they have learned how to play on a Stradivarius violin. I mean, Eric was just kind of showing that I have this full range of being able to play across the what we call the sounding point of the instrument. Some Stradivarius violins, you can only play here. They will only sound if they play here. If you go here, You'll, you're going to lose the sound entirely. So your technique as a player playing on you know a 16 or 17 million dollar Strat or Del Jesu, you'll get gold here. But if you go there, you're going to lose all of it. And, and it, it, is, it is an adjustment of micrometers um, in terms of the way that the bow feels. You know, some, something as subtle as playing with this much rotation to playing with that much rotation can completely change the sound. Um, so, you know, that's the thing is like one will make their whole life and technique about that instrument. But then there is a kind of, um, you know, you can call it fate, you can call it cruelty. Um, you know, there have been it's all kinds of stories of instruments, great instruments owned by a bank. The bank goes bust. It's acquired by another bank. The bank doesn't see the instrument as a work of art that's part of a musician's soul. The bank sees the instrument as an asset. We have to you know, consolidate our assets, the violin comes back to the bank. And the, and the violinist, the violinist has lost a part of their soul. Um, and so there was, a, there was a part of that where I frankly didn't want to continue sort of getting played <laughs> by donors who said, well, you can play my violin if or when. The condition, the obligation just was not interesting to me because it's not a creative environment in which I can give my soul and my time. So it's probably a little able, stressful, right? I mean, I mean, one of the most stressful things. Yeah. Um, and you also, worry about that. well, and, and it's, it's also a thing, too, where I really wanted to support a local maker mm -hmm. that mattered to me so much. And well, and, and also that er Eric had gone out of his way to make an instrument that was a multi-million dollar instrument that I would never own in my life, this Montagnana gorgeous 1731 violin, Eric went out of his way to try to make that instrument mine. And I knew then that the trust that we had built was um, something I wanted to cherish and celebrate for the rest of my artistic career. So um, I frankly prefer playing on Eric's violin more than I prefer, than, more than I like playing on a Strad or a Dil Jesu or a great instrument. because. I know what I can get out of this instrument. Um, 
So that that's very important to say. And, you know, now, of course, it's also my finicky, fiddly nature. I'm always bringing, I mean, like, I'm going to leave one of these in, these instruments with Eric today to work on, to like kind of finagle things to <laughs> get it sound better. While I'm here, absolutely, while I'm here, I'm always dropping off bows for being, you know, rehaired, um, you know, because I'm going to have a recording session in a couple of days where I'm going to be playing on that Baroque violin and it has to sound like a million bucks. Right. And it and it will. So it sounds like you two really have developed a, a, a pretty, um, in some ways, intimate relationship. I mean, you really, you're working on the artistic level, but you've really gotten to know each other, um, you know, pretty deeply. Um, and what, so Eric, tell me what that has been like. And, and, and you're trusting Vijay with your instruments and he's trusting you to, you know, make the instrument something that is going to be magical for him. You know, that's a, that's a pretty interesting. I'm on the honored side. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a huge honor because I, I make instruments and they are your children. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no two ways. You can't create art and not feel like you've got, you know, a vested interest in its outcome and its life beyond you. So it's the honor's all mine to have him play, play my instrument. So, um yeah, <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll sort of add though that I I've you know I, I came to LA when I was very young I was I was a teenager when I moved to Los Angeles and and when I joined the LA Philharmonic I had a number of colleagues who kind of adopted me and um, one of those colleagues in particular um, a, a violinist named Mitch Newman who played in the LA Phil for several years uh, he was kind of like brother uncle dad to me when i was in the orchestra he played i think i think did he didn't he buy the first violin you ever made uh no or one of the uh, early th ones that was um guido oh guido, guido right was another la yeah. film member yeah. who was like another brother uncle dad yeah. to me bought one of eric's first violins so i mean i was also being introduced to a group of colleagues who said this is someone you can trust mm -hmm. And I trusted them. And when I would come and play in Eric's shop, he would say, ah, you're the kind of player who needs X. Mm -hmm. And he would just say that. And I didn't know that I was that kind of player. <laughs> and so the first time I was hearing that, oh, you're a kind of race car driver, like, you know, the metaphors that Eric is using, I didn't think of myself that way. And so I've been able to develop a sense of regard for myself, a sense of self-regard, mm -hmm. um, by being in this space, by playing on these instruments. Um, you know, and I'll also say that, you know, I've trusted Eric with the acquisition and the sale um, of bows because Eric also has, you know, bows, other instruments, violins that he's selling. If I have a student who's looking for an instrument, if I have a colleague who's looking for an instrument, this is the first shop I recommend. Um, and just a couple of, you know, weeks ago, I got to record with a string quartet of all LA film members. And, mm -hmm. You know, one other member, the, the cellist, was playing on one of Eric's instruments. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we find ourselves in a string quartet thrown together and it's like, oh, you're playing a Benning. Oh, you're playing a Benning. Oh, we should make a Benning string quartet. Yeah, you know, right. it's that kind of thing where um, you meet people who uh, love these instruments and the instruments get along in an ensemble, which is really cool. Yeah, that it, one interesting story about that. My great uncle Carl Becker on his 100th anniversary. Uh, birthday anniversary they put together an entire orchestra of his instruments <laughs> wow <laughs> all, vi all the violins violas and cellos were his instruments and it didn't quite sound right uh, interesting. quite honestly interesting because they were all too homogenous huh. wow um, i think it would work great in a quartet but in an orchestral setting it was just a little there was something because you know they're all intense soloistic instruments you need some of those dusty, dark, <laughs> you know, muffled, low tones and things like that. It was an interesting, interesting celebration. Just a little side thing. <laughs> Me too, but I don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Well, certainly. Well, well th thank you for the question. So Street Symphony is a nonprofit organization that I started in 2011 uh, with several colleagues from the LA Philharmonic at the time, um, although now the organization has branched off into playing and presenting music by top-notch jazz and mariachi and reggae and hip-hop artists who all live here in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is the epicenter of the crisis of homelessness in America today. Um, we have uh, more people sleeping in tents and sleeping bags on the streets of downtown Los Angeles than uh, most American cities combined. Um, and when we, the, the, the central geographical location of that is a place called Skid Row. And when I joined Los, when I joined the LA Philharmonic, I became involved in a story of a, of a musician named Nathaniel Anthony Ayers, um, who was the subject of a book and a movie called The Soloist. And in fact, there's an episode where uh, Mr. Ayers actually walked from downtown Los Angeles to this very shop mm -hmm. um, with his uh, violin. Um, Nathaniel was one of the first black men to attend the Juilliard School, um, but was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And it was around that time that I kind of became his violin teacher. I was in my early 20s at the time, but he wanted violin lessons. I wanted to make music with him. And from that time, we've presented probably thousands of concerts um, in shelters, clinics, county jails, prisons. Um, you know, and, and these concerts first started off as a typical outreach concert. You know, we were playing for people who wouldn't have access to listening to music like what we would perform in a concert hall. Um, but what was amazing about making music in a clinic or a shelter is that people in our audiences would raise their hands and they would say, well, what's the story of that piece of music? What was that composer going through? Because whatever was happening in that Beethoven stormy music, that, that's my life story. So what, what, it, what is that? And that's the first time that us performers said, well, yeah, what is the human story of this composer? Because we had learned how to play the notes right, but I don't think we had asked what was the intention behind this particular piece of music. And um, it was always eye-opening for us because people in Skid Row who were sometimes going through the very worst moments of their lives seemed to have more, emo more emotional acuity, more kind of emotional intelligence that was tied into the expression of the music, and it created this dialogue. And now we've created um, workshops, choirs, ensembles that mix professional and community artists side by side. And every month we have a series of programs where we perform in Skid Row shelters. We perform regularly at the Midnight Mission and the Downtown Women's Center. I bring this very instrument inside those shelters with me. Um, and, um, you know, then we'll also go into a prison and a, a project and, and do the same same concert. But, you know, it was also remarkable to learn about Eric and Eric's family's work in, in Mexico. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, well, we've been going down to Mexico for over 40 years, but it started an orphanage. And my mom had adopted a young man by the name of Tito Quiros. And he she taught him violin and then he started a bunch of music academies because he he saw the need in Mexico like everyone was racing to come up to the states but he's like there's a need in Mexico so that's one of his his mantras is like I'm a Mexican mm -hmm. I you know how do you say it in Spanish but anyway yeah. he, he's very proud that he's a Mexican and he wanted to ennoble his own people um, and so he started these music academies very much like the El Sistema um, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been now that I think there's five academies in five different of in the different states of Mexico. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with hundreds of kids in each one, and it's this, you know, I don't know the best way to put it, but it's just this very ennobling music is so transformative, and it's I don't know there's something quite quite magical about being presented music. Uh, in a very, very professional way um, that 
you know, just touches you so deeply, you know, and then to be taught, to be considered worthy to be taught. Um, some of these people, you know, they come from nothing and then they're just, you know, like I said, homeless or whatever, but to be considered worthy to be performed to or to be taught, it's just very ennobling. Mm -hmm. I, th I think there's a, a reconnection with humanity that mm -hmm. music establishes mm -hmm. for all of us. And I think the question that we're both asking is, you know, why is the hall the only place where that yeah. gets to happen? I, I think it happens in rooms like this. This is a sacred place to me. And I think that mm -hmm. we can create the feeling of sacred with intention with each other. And that's, I think, what we're trying to do is to welcome all people into their creative and artistic lives. Um, that's where we come alive and become our most whole selves. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not just um, something to be reserved as high art. That's something that feeds back to me so much as an artist. I, I play differently when I play in, in shelters or clinics. Um, I've never been nervous playing in a place like that, but I wonder why I feel nervous on the stage of a concert hall. What's different about those two places? And I feel like in one place, I have to be the perfect artistic product that an audience has paid really good money to come and see. And in another place, it's not that I give anything less or anything uh, less of a, of a standard, but now it's a gift to this audience and it's a gift that comes back to me. And I actually want to bring that kind of playing yeah. back to the concert hall. Yeah, the freedom. Yeah. I totally get that. I totally get that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, I think I heard, uh, I, I, I watched some of your videos on YouTube, VJ, and uh, you said music is the language that doesn't lie. Mm. If I said that, that's good. What's that? If I said that, that's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did, and it was good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I thought that that was um, really kind of clarifying uh, mm. in a way. It's It's sort of you know, it's it's delivering the same message maybe to to everyone, uh, mm. and it's just mm. people hear it differently. I don't know. Mm. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we have um, a lot of questions from our viewers. Are you guys up for answering a few? Sure, sure. let's go for it. Ready? Okay. So the first thing people wanted to know was, um, Eric, if you play yourself, uh, how do you know so intimately? You know how this is going to sound. Yeah, I, I grew up, obviously, my mother, I, I played a bunch of instruments growing up. Um, my brother is a professional violinist, and I played a little of everything, mainly because my mom and my brother, who are consummate musicians, the, my mom couldn't understand why I wouldn't want to just practice for six hours in my room all by myself. And for me, that was like torture. I was like, I don't want to sit here and practice for, for two hours, you know. I'd much rather, like I, she had a work uh, workbench in her, in the garage. My mom's a, a very good maker. Um, the first female maker in, allowed into the German violin making uh, school in Mittenwald. And so I would sit next to her and she had a box of cut off wood. And I would sit there and I would create these things. This is pre-TV. She didn't let us watch TV. So I would create these little things out of wood. And I could do that for hours. But she would, OK, time for practicing. And I was just like, man, I'm just being tortured here. So I learned, you know, because through osmosis. But when I saw my brother, Brian, who all he has to do is he just hears a piece. And he'll play it back for you. Uh, you know, and he's just, everything came so easily to him in that regard that I realized that is not where my talent lies. This is where my talent lies. It lies in the crafting of these things. And so at that point, I think that kind of helps me in, in the sense where, like I said earlier, I don't bring to the table my standard. You know, when he asks me for an adjustment, I'm asking him what he wants. You know, it'd be like going to a tailor and saying, you know, I want something that fits me perfectly. I'm like, well, this fits me perfectly. You know, here, put this on. I'm asking him what he wants, and I know how, and then it's physics for me, and it's craftsmanship, it's artistry. Um, I can manipulate these things. I, I'm good at it. I know how to do that, and I, that's where I feel comfortable. Like when somebody comes in and, you know, I also know what the limitations of these things are. Like I, this Baroque violin, it's like looking at a Model T. 
Mm. And I look at it and I go, okay, that's a Model T. So it's never going to do NASCAR. It's never going to be, you know, the front of a concert hall with the rest of the LA field, you know, completely drowning it out. Because everyone else showed up to the concert hall with, with cannons like this. You know, so th the the rest of it's, you know, understanding how how physics work and the principles behind them. So, yeah, sorry. No, that's really interesting. And it, um, the, it brings up a couple of other questions that are related to things that were texted to us. And one is, do you adjust a violin ever for the composer or is it always for the player? I've never adjusted for a composer because um, the player's interpretation. Um, I've adjusted, I was talking earlier to Lewis about, I've adjusted uh, for certain microphones. Uh, I had a gentleman, I had a gentleman who insisted upon using old Heifetz style ribbon microphones. And so I had to adjust his violin to sound good for a microphone, but that's as esoteric, I think, as I've, as I've gotten. Okay. Um, and then another technical question. Um, somebody wants to know, one of our viewers, um, how math is used in violin making. And uh, Vijay, you could probably answer this as well. For measuring oh. the of wood, the geometry and the patterns, seems like math is very important. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... Do either of you have to say about that? Well, there are giant textbooks and lectures on how all the golden principles in laying out the circles and how we came to all these designs and patterns. I mean, you could just knock yourself silly however you want to do it. Um, I know the geometry that I use to create our pattern, but once your mold is set, I just keep using that mold time and time again. Um, oftentimes I've been asked to make a, a specific copy of an instrument. Uh, I made a copy of a, of a viola called the Zanetto viola from 1550. And I can tell you that had no golden principles at all in it. It was so quirky and so strange. And the upper part of Italy, um, they're known for their very rustic shapes. They would, they would create uh, basically ribs on a flat plate and then just sort of things bent the way they bent. They weren't sitting there, you know, forcing it into a mold. They just kind of like creating it as they go. That's why, you know, you'll see almost like a Quasimodo style shapes to it. And you're like, oh, this wasn't thought through. This was just organically happened. Um, Stradivarius is a lot more constrained. It's a lot more uniform. You could see, you know, you can put patterns on top of each other from, from the years, and they vary so slightly. And the variances that do happen are just a result of interaction with musicians who say, hey, uh, you know, like, oh, you're making your cellos too big. Would you mind making them a little mm -hmm. bit smaller? Mm -hmm. So you'll see, like, if there's this great outlines of, of Strad's cellos, and everything stays the same in the center. And as, as people's requirements for smaller cellos go, he starts just lopping off the top and the bottom a little bit. He's not, he doesn't completely redo his pattern, you know, because the molds are hard to make. Mm -hmm. He just literally, like, oh, let me, let me shave a little bit off here and a little bit off there. And you'll see some of his very late cellos almost has a flat spot there. And uh, it's so practical. And so sometimes we're so in love with the mystical, like, oh, yeah, if I can get this, you know, golden principle just right here, it's going to somehow. And then you look at some of the great old instruments, and you're like, oh, yeah, he. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, then you, you can compare and contrast Guarneri, Del Gesù, yeah. to Strad. And there's even this kind of conjecture that, you know, was Del Gesù just drunk all the time because <laughs> patter, pa patterns don't match and instruments are weird and 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 yet there's also that kind of guttural nature i mean mm -hmm. strad is pure gold it's just elegant aristocratic sound guarneri is this kind of like bloodlust in the yeah. sound you know and and you have to and you have to play the instruments that you way play like, them differently yeah they're... and i'm like my my teacher was a concert master of the new york philharmonic who now lives here in los angeles glenn dictoro uh would just hand me his guarnery del jesu in lessons when i was growing up and say this is what a great fiddle sounds like just play on it and i would have to play it like him mm -hmm. and i would have to really dig into the sound um and then i changed the way i played when i started playing on this violin which is um you know in reference to a 
Stradivarius. So my playing changed. I now want to have that super aristocratic sound. And it kind of works its way into my personality mm -hmm. in a way. One other math thing I will, will say, I'm constantly fiddling with strings. And there's mm -hmm. different string gauges. Um, and all the time, especially as I'm getting into gut strings, looking at what's the right string thickness or length or gauge or, you know, how do you... I'm also playing at different hertz frequencies. This violin is tuned at A equals 415. This is tuned at A440, which is almost a half step difference. Um, and so I'm always thinking about, you know, what is in tune is about how the instrument is resonating um, and then how I'm resonating with that. Wow. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. There are some people who would love to hear you play again. Uh, mm -hmm. BJ, would you like to do that? <laughs> I'd be more than happy to. And in fact, I'm wondering if I should play a couple of notes on the Baroque violin. Yeah, yeah do it. Um, which would be, uh, would be would be fun. So um, yeah, by the time I walk over there, I'll decide what I'm going to play. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I'll ask Eric a question while you walk okay. over there. So Eric, people want to know um, if you have favorite woods that you. Well, I, I typically use all the same wood. Um, so I use Bosnian maple for the back and sides, and we have Italian, northern Italian spruce that we use for the top. I've started. Like I'm, I made a cello back out of an American piece of um, Canadian big leaf maple. And not only did it kill my tools faster because it had a lot of like mineral in it, uh, but I, it just didn't feel correct in my fingers. Um, it was, you know, it, it'd be like, you know, being taught a recipe and, and having a different, you know, different, it just didn't feel right in my hands. And now I know a ton of makers who use American woods really, really successfully. Um, it just didn't feel right for me. And if I'm going to spend that much time, I need to know it, that at the end of that process, I'm going to have the result I expect. You know, because I can't spend a couple hundred hours and then go, oops, yeah, that didn't turn out very good. I guess I guess I got to change that. So, um, yeah, I, I use very, very consistent materials. Um, when I'm asked to commission an instrument, that's when I, you know, like if somebody wanted a Guarneri sound, that's that bloodlust you were talking about. I would pick something that's that's that heavier weight. You'd leave the thicknesses a little bit heavier. It gives you more to drive into. It's sort of that feeling of of just really having to work, but then the response is rewarding. Um, if, if somebody, like right now, somebody's commissioned a, another Strad model and they want a very easy sound, they want it just to just the bow to just, you know, activate the whole thing immediately. Uh, so you have to pick the woods that would do that. And that's definitely not a Guarneri setup. It's going to be a more Strad setup. So anyway. interesting. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> that was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was just magical. Um, we loved it, and we so appreciate it. And thanks for being with us today and everything you shared. We really appreciate it. Now we go Thank back you so to much. Rachel, who will close things out. Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you.